First and foremost, I'm a classroom teacher. I like to, I like to quote Dr. John Henry Clark on that. And he said it best. He said, "What do you want to be remembered for is being a good classroom teacher." And I consider myself a good classroom teacher. Um, my style is very, very eclectic. I bring a lot of things to my style, uh, to, to my classroom. I bring history, I bring philosophy, I bring linguistics, uh, I bring life experience. But most importantly, I think, is I bring myself. And I like to let my students know about things in a very real perspective. And so I teach a lot of different courses. I teach courses in African history, civilization, particularly what we like to refer to as classical African civilization because there's a real distinction between I love America Negro history, African American history, and African history, and classical African history. So let me start with the, the latter first. Classical African history begins with Nile Valley civilizations. And what I mean by Nile Valley civilizations, I'm talking about ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet, as they used to call it, the black community or the black land, as it is, uh, or, or, or the black town, as it was originally written in the uh, in the ancient Egyptian script called miscalled hieroglyphics, and it's really known as Medunetra, which is um, means something like divine speech or more like God's language. That's what it really translated out, and that was the name that they called it. And that also includes ancient Kush. Ancient Kush which is in what we call the Sudan today, was really the foundations of classical Nile Valley civilization. And as Dr. John Henry Clark once said, the Nile River was the first cultural highway in history. So that all of the culture that we see that comes up through the Nile Valley starts with that. And so our history must start with that. Dr. Sheikh Anta who, uh, who has passed away, uh, always emphasized to us the importance of starting our history with Nile Valley civilization. Because if you study European history today, you cannot get around the study of Greece and Rome. It is just inseparable. Even though, when we look at the early German uh, scholars who began to write about this history and their need to start history with Greece and Rome, they were not even descendants of the Greeks or the Romans. But it was important for them to go back to that place in order to start their history. And so it's very important that we start our history with the Nile Valley. And then there is African American history. African American history, we have to remember, does not start in 1619 Jamestown, Virginia, where the Dutch man of warship dropped off 19 black people at Jamestown, Virginia, uh, who in fact were not slaves when they got here, but were enslaved when they got here. And there's a big difference between that, but the assumption is that our history starts with slavery. The, the implication of the saying that our history starts with slavery is that our history starts out negatively. There's nothing positive about our history because our history starts with slavery. And slavery is a negative experience and slavery is a negative event. And so, while there was a lot of good and positive stuff that came out of the... Um, the, the slavery experience here in America, most of it was negative and the implications of that experience are obvious in the fact that we lost our name, we lost our history, we lost our culture, we lost our language, we lost everything that identifies people as a nation. So all of that is gone. But when we go back and we look at our history in Africa, most of the history of Africa starts out with places like uh, Songhe, Mali, and Ghana, which are very, very important, but very few people talk about Carthage in ancient Carthage and the, the history of ancient Carthage and about the great uh, uh, Bartha family, Hannibal and Hasdrubal and Megara and all these people who were very, very important who were the controllers and rulers of the Mediterranean Sea long before the Romans even had a military and were able to do that. And it's very interesting that when you look at the early history of, uh, um, of the early European history, when you go back and look at Polybius, Polybius in his history, who was considered one of the first uh, writers of history in Europe or historiographers, Polybius starts out his history with Carthage. Now that's very interesting. And, and the fact that the military tactics that Hannibal used to, uh, to do all of his particular conquests throughout Europe and throughout, say, places like uh, Syracuse, which is now called Sicily today, are taught in the military colleges in the Western world, says a lot for him, besides the fact that they were a significant civilization. They built some of the, they built the first navy true That other people didn't have navies. Egypt later on had a navy and so forth, but the Carthaginians had a navy. taught about them because of the assumption that the Carthaginians were not 
a pe group of Africans, even though they had the most powerful civilization in Africa, and very few people talk about that. There were people very, very concerned about them. Even if you go back and look at the early history of the Romans, the Romans used to tell people all the time that, you know, if their children got in trouble, they used to tell their children all the time, if you don't act right, Hannibal's gonna come and get you. All right, now, not only that, but that some of the major, for five generations, one of the major Roman rulers, uh, 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 families ruling in Rome as emperors were the Severan family. Septimius Severus, his son Caracalla, and so forth. All of these were actually Africans who were in control of Rome for a significant period of time. And even when you read Machiavelli's The Prince, Machiavelli has a whole chapter in there where he deals with Septimius Severus and his battles that he had had. But most people don't realize that these people were Africans because they don't see Africa in it. And that's part of one of the things that happened in doing that is when, for example, when uh, the Europeans came into Egypt and started their conquest under Napoleon in 1798, uh, two things happened. They came in with a scholarly uh, 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 army of... Um, of um, of uh, a military army, they came in with a scholarly army. I like to say the military army came in to conquer the land and the scholarly army came, army came in to conquer the monuments. But what also happened at that time was that Egypt was being removed from Africa. So once Egypt began to be removed from Africa, then the Egyptians got also taken out of Egypt. So Egypt was removed from Africa and the Africans were removed from Egypt. And that's what happened. And once they happened, then they could make up all type of stories about who the ancient Egyptians were and what they were like. And when people look at the Egypt today and they see the people over there that they think are the ancient Egyptians, these are really Arabs who didn't get there until 639 AD under the Arab invasion. So that's very, very important history to know but it's also not history that's told, but it's not unknown history. And so it's very important we're looking at the history of, of, of Africa and, and that we understand that there's a lot about that history. The great civilization of Canem Borno, you know, you had the, 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 uh, the uh, great uh, uh, mosque university at uh, Timbuktu. Uh, the University of Sankore, you had the University of Salamanca. I went to school in Spain in 1972 and I went to the University of Sevilla, which was a Moorish uh, university at the time uh, in, in the early days. Between 711 and 1492, the Moors controlled all of Spain for 700 years and now what people fail to realize is that the Moors were not Arabs, but they were Africans who had practiced Islam. And so that's a very, very important thing to know. And the significance of their work is, I can't even begin to explain how significant their work is beyond the fact of telling you very briefly that you had great works of philosophy among the Greeks that were exist that existed at the great Alexandrian library in Egypt. When the Arabs came in, they uh, acquired a lot of this knowledge. This knowledge was then translated into Arabic, but it was from those Arabic translations that uh, of the Greek writings that those writings were later on translated into Latin, which later became became available in most of the schools of Europe. Now, of course, the point I point I, the problem I point out in my philosophy classes is that we know how copying things occurs, and when you make copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of, copies of stuff. You also get uh, uh, interpolations, embellishments, uh, mistranslations, and so forth. So when we have all of the works of Plato, uh, Aristotle, particularly his metaphysics and his politics and so forth and so on, today the question we have to ask is do we have an actual copy of what these people wrote or do we have a, a facsimile of what they wrote? As I like to tell my class all the time, you have to ask yourself, is it live or is it Memorex?